people. <laughs> okay, welcome to our November luncheon. It's been a while, had, had some storms that came through, kind of delayed things. But uh, I want to thank Comic and Subaru for sponsoring our luncheon. Looking forward to the program. You guys don't mind, but we'll be coming here. No. We can. They're gonna. I think Tony set up. We can party till two o'clock in the morning. Absolutely. All right. We can have fun. We'll have a live band and whatever you guys need. So, and Valley Park will be all set up. Yeah. Thank Far you. Away. <laughs> or you can ride. <laughs> 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 you guys can walk. <laughs> the uh, other item of business is to nominate officers, and that's supposed to be conducted by the secretary, but neither he nor. I mean, for as a president to be here today, they had something come up. So uh, I will accept the nomination for you. Yes. Go ahead and take the the list. I'm sorry. Will you take the nomination? Record the nomination. I will take the I will be the secretary. Yes. You'll be the secretary. Yes, sir. <laughs> Marcel knows what he's doing. Uh, we'll start, like, like I said in, in the email that came out that I mean, did put out, uh, as you may know, that the president is limited to two years, but I mean, is still eligible, but uh, for presidency. So, we'll accept nominations for president now. Hi. Don't ever, don't ever jump here all at once I. here. I nominate Rick. Rick. Okay, we have Rick Reed. Do we have a second somewhere? Second. Second. There we go. I think they were colluding. <laughs> They'll add them back there. Nah. Juan Robin. Juan Robin. Oh, Juan Robin is here today, by the yes. way. We have a second. I'll second. 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 Anybody else? Tom. Okay, for uh, vice president, do we have? Don't everybody step here at once. I mean, don't don't yell at once. Oh, what? Second. Second. Okay. Third. Treasurer, Marcelo Serrano. Second. 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 Yes. <laughs> For secretary. We're up to $9,285 in the account, uh, getting ready for a holiday party. So I have uh, sent invoices to the manufacturers. We're getting a great response from the manufacturers that want to participate, and they're excited to come down here, and hopefully we're going to have weather just like today for them. So looking forward to that. Uh, thanks to Super once again for being here. Yes. This is a tough one, but we appreciate you guys coming down. And then we do have some new members. Some of you might know uh, Jake Tucker, uh, one of the founder uh, members for Gamma, has moved down to Jupiter. 
So Jim and Michelle, his wife, have moved down uh, from you know, Southern, Southern Automotive Journal, Inc. is their magazine. And then also we have Gustavo Daniel Ventre uh, here with us, who Terry test uh, is somewhere here. But I wanted to welcome him as a new member. So thank you very much. And that's all I have for now. I think the plan, uh, if you want to share with them the plan for today. Uh, why don't you just share the plan? Uh, I will say, uh, well, we'll have the uh, lunch and then the presentation, correct? But then we also have uh, John, because Kenneth was by earlier, but had to had to leave because he had a, a call. Uh, some uh, keepsake programs from the auto show out there at the table. You can pick one and take it home. Cool. It will become highly valuable because it's a collector's edition. Since nobody else saw it, <laughs> but uh, Dave Morphe, I guess that uh, they're already thinking about maybe moving back to November next year yes. when they get the convention center. Happy, do you have anything as far as the website? Everything is fine. Smooth. Good. Sorry. Okay. Does anybody else have anything that they, they want to bring up? Complaints, praise, or <laughs> okay? Thank you. And serve and yeah. have the program. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us today for lunch, uh, we have a painful presentation for you. Uh, hopefully, not too bad. We'll talk a little bit about uh, about the all the cross track, but also that I want to talk about just for a moment about uh, Subaru in general. And this is our 50th anniversary this year. Um, so we'll be a little bit more culmination of that next year, I think, in February is our actual 50th anniversary. But it's been 50 years since the company started here in the US. And uh, so it's, it's a big deal for us. And Harvey Land and Malcolm Bricklin, you've probably heard of these guys, Lisa Bricklin, uh, quite a famous character. Uh, and, and they were famous characters. There's the 360, which is the first vehicle that we brought into the US. And then one of the earlier FFs, I believe, as well. But uh, rather inauspicious start. And one of the reasons we are headquartered in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. They're both from Philadelphia originally. Actually, Malcolm Bricklin uh, went to the University of Florida uh, for, I think, two years before he left, uh, either because he wanted to leave or he was forced out. We can't <laughs> figure out exactly. But he actually went on to start uh, one of his first businesses right out of college. So he's always been a bit of an entrepreneur and still still going strong. Uh, many of us will see, I don't know if you guys got it or not, he was asking us all to join on LinkedIn recently, if you're connected to Super. But uh, yeah, so the company itself uh, started in 58 in Japan. It's a conglomeration of uh, several Japanese firms. Uh, they specialize with everything from airplanes, uh, trains, maybe buses and things like that, then got into cars in 58 with a grant from the Japanese government uh, to build this, the, the 360. They were looking for something that was cheap, post-war, small uh, to drive, and then uh, Franklin decided to bring it over to the US. Um, things have changed quite a bit since then. Uh, this is a look at, at, our, at our sales growth, and we're now, we have the best record for continuous sales growth in, in, of any manufacturer. This is our 70th consecutive month. Um, and eight years of, of, of non-stop growth. And as you can tell, I, I started right here, and then it just took off. That was why. <laughs> yeah. I used to work for Chrysler. I left. Look what happened to them. <laughs> They're owned by Italians. And we know Italians. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, this is a, oops. It went invisible. Click it again. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, Brian Tenko is joining us. He's actually from the like, zone director down here. And as you can see, South Florida also, oh, Florida in general, I should say, taken off quite quite quickly. If you look back here, even as far back as uh, 2008, look how few cars we were selling. Um, and this other chart here is, is interesting. This is uh, actually how many units in operation. So. When I was growing up down in South Florida, you never saw Subaru's Hall back in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the 80s. Uh, I think the first one I ever remember seeing is a friend of mine's uh, mom bought one of the US ski team type, the white station wagons. You know, yeah. if you remember those old ads, they had that. And then a friend of mine, uh, 
was forced, he moved, his family moved down from Connecticut. Because only Northerners had ever heard of Subaru, they brought their Subaru with them. And uh, we tried to kill that car. We, we could not destroy it because he wanted to get his dad's uh, Supra. That was the goal. We figured if we could make this, you know, fall apart. It didn't work, uh, even though we tried tremendously. But obviously, we're projecting even in bigger sales growth through here. And as Brian was telling us, like, you know, we're actually still somewhat under dealer down here. We only have 36 dealers in this region. So we're sort of looking at South Florida, even all the way up through into, you have Georgia as well, right? Parts of Georgia, parts of Yeah. So uh, it's, it's obviously an area where we, we want to start growing. Um, and we've been trying to do that, I think, across the country, moving into, into regions where we're not well known. Very well known in the Northwest, Northeast, you know, starting in Colorado, obviously, in Utah, anywhere there was skiing going on. But we're starting to see that move down and, and kind of move out throughout the, throughout the rest of the nation. You know? And one of the ways we got there, and one of the, the big sea changes we made back in the early 2000s was to change the way we, we sold the product and advertised the product. Uh, a lot of that went in through repricing. We decided to go in and, and, and try to become a company that didn't rely on uh, incentives to sell the cars. And then we looked at the way the, the cars were actually promoted. And we realized that you know we had all of these love letters from our owners. People really bonded with their cars, uh, more so than, than other brands. And so we moved into that. And the biggest thing from, like I said, when I started, and Brian probably when you were, was this top of the chart here, awareness. That number would have been probably in, in 2004, 2005, in under 10% or so. People just didn't know what Subaru was. Half the people who saw the name Subaru thought it was a Saab. We did a very bad job because we were, like everyone else, advertising individual models. And what we did was we changed that and started advertising the brand itself. We felt, you know, when we started looking at the demographics and psychographics, as I say, of the brand, people tended to have the same likes and uses and whatnot with their cars, more so than it went throughout the product range. So it didn't really matter if you were buying a Legacy or an Outback, you were still the same kind of person. You were buying a Forester or an Outback Sport back then, all those things. It was almost the same kind of brand. You had this desire to go outdoors. You wanted that kind of a rugged feel. Uh, and people were doing that in their legacy sedans as much as they were in their Outbacks. It was all the same kind of kind of thing. So we started focusing on the brand itself. And as you can see, now we're back up in here with our uh, with our competitive set here. You can probably guess what the mid-sized German and the mid-sized Koreans are. And not only that is also when we get down to the point where it's this excellent opinion is really good. Because it's not only that people recognize us now, it's when they do, they have a very positive opinion of what Subaru is. You know, we're reliable, we're very safe cars, and that's permeated through the messaging. And this is, like I was just saying here, that's part of what you get. When you go in and look at what the research shows that the, that the buyers are remembering from the other advertisements, outdoor, recreational, very safe, rugged, tough, durable, Functional versatility, our cars are very usable. It's one of the things you look at any of our cars, you're looking either if it's a trunk or if it's a hatchback, you're looking at a space that's very easy to get to get junk into and, and move things with, etc. Start looking at, at, at these guys, and I'm looking at the Koreans, it's all about pricing. It's all about being on sale, it's good value, things of that nature. And also then we get to the German, which is a Volkswagen fun drive, responsive handling, etc. But they're you're starting to see these secondary messages fall off. So that's been very positive for us with this messaging. And then when you go look at the actual individual product lines for the cars, the same thing. It's, like I said, the same mindset of a buyer. No matter which car he's buying, he tends to think the same way. And he he's getting the same takeaway from the marketing itself. So when he looks at that, those are the things he's remembering. And this is something we focused on very much, is the fact that we, because of the all-wheel drive systems we have, we you know, real all-wheel drive on these cars, uh, not just part-time. People do see us as being a more adventurous brand, almost kind of like a sub-Jeep brand, where you're going to take the cars and use them. And our, our owners do tend to go off-road at a very high percent of our guys actually go off-road. And Todd will talk a little bit more about that with Crosstrack. Now, we're just looking at, uh, at our sales this year, going very strong once again, knock on wood. We just had another great uh, sales month in September. Uh, it's one of our best September's ever. And part of that we're going to talk to you about is Crosstrek is doing incredibly well, as is the all-new Impreza. We are making the Impreza in the U.S. now. Um, 
Crosstrek itself, I think I'll let Todd go into that, but we, when we first started bringing Crosstrek into the country, we had no idea it was going to be as big a success as it has been, and it quickly jumped up to number three in sales. But I now back and forth here. This is obviously very important to us uh, on the business side. <coughs> We're spending less to sell our cars than all the other manufacturers. We have the lowest incentives in the industry, and a lot of the thousand dollar you do see there are things we've done in, in certain states just to be competitive in terms of financing <coughs> and things like that. That counts. That's kind of, kind of a need to do things from a business standpoint in certain states. But we're doing, we're doing very well while spending very little money on the cars. Uh, and this is kind of showing like where, where, we've, where we've started to start growing in 08 is when we started to resize the cars for the American market. Um, up, up until then, they were a, a bit too small. Even though back to the 04 uh, Outback and Legacy, they're just a little bit, a little bit too small rear seat leg, leg room. If you had bigger kids, older children, kind of growing out of the car. Once we started making that change, we saw our sales go up, and we also got tied in with better marketing. And this is a very interesting slide. Uh, I think when you look at when when you look at what uh, millennials are thinking about our cars, when when they look at buying a Subaru. Look at their the rate, how long they intend to keep that car, and, and think that car is going to last for them, right? So when they look at other brands, millennials are expecting, you know, maybe you're going to keep a car for five years. When you look at ours, they're thinking ten years. And the same thing with the other generation, Gen X, um, as well as Boomers. They're all thinking that they're going to keep these cars for a long time. And that tends to be our buyer makeup. We're not a company that survives on leasing and and, and quick sales. They tend to be people who are a little bit more careful with their money. They buy the car, they hold them longer, and they usually don't sell them. The cars usually get passed down through the families, and it tends to take a while for them to get out of there, right? So they're, they're, they're still used. That's it for me. Um, what is the warranty that uh, you have? Three years, 36,000 miles, and then five years in the powertrain. Uh, it's standard. Yeah. Standard. I think Todd Hills can talk to you more about the Crosstrek itself, which we just launched. Dr. Todd coming up or me leaving? Okay. Okay, uh, so my name is Todd Hill. I'm the Carline Planning Manager for Crosstrek. And I uh, just wanted to come uh, here and give you guys a brief overview of the car. Dom asked me to come down. And so this is the condensed version of uh, my Crosstrek overview. Uh, so first up, uh, a little bit of the kind of the sales history. And as Dom said, when we first uh, decided to bring the car over to the U.S., we really had kind of a modest expectation for how well it was going to do, and it immediately just took off. And you know, it took off. Every year since we brought it uh, to market, we've increased sales over the previous year, and with the current generation, uh, we're thinking that's going to continue. But another thing that's worth kind of keeping in mind is when we brought the, the Crosstrek over, it didn't impact Impreza at all. Impreza sales were, were pretty much flat, four-door and five-door over this time, and it did increase uh, with the new generation of Impreza, but uh, it basically wasn't affected. Uh, and so for Crosstrek, those buyers were uh, largely new to our brand, so we weren't stealing from existing uh, models in our portfolio. We're bringing in new people, which is uh, really why Crosstrek was so great for us. Um, and when we look at where it fits in in the segment, um, you know, we've got a lot of different competitors that have come into this uh, small uh, crossover segment, and uh, we've done uh, really, really well. We're uh, basically in the number two spot uh, for 2016 calendar year, and uh, as Dom said, we did that without a lot of incentives, and without a lot of, uh, you know, kind of cash on the hood, uh, so to speak. And so we're, we're really happy that uh, we're able to get that position ahead of some really strong brands with some really competitive product. Um, we were able to achieve this uh, this rate of sale. So again, we're, we're very uh, thrilled with what this car has done for us. And then we get to the uh, the portfolio, and uh, as I mentioned, it's bringing in a lot of new models for us, or so new buyers to us. So we look at who's who's buying the car. So uh, really, especially appealing to 25, 29 to 29 year old buyers. That uh, that uh, bump right there. Um, and overall, 64%, almost two-thirds of the buyers of Crosstrek are new to our brand. And 
the other part that's kind of a, a strange mix is that 64% are new to the brand, but 20% it's their third or more uh, Subaru that they've owned. So there's a lot of loyal buyers in there as well. In terms of what the people do, uh, their occupations are kind of similar to the Subaru brand average. Uh, a lot of technical uh, professions, uh, healthcare, uh, computer information technology, engineering, uh, and education. And when we look at uh, other aspects of the owners, uh, more than half of uh, cross track owners own a dog. So you know, we show dogs in our advertising, uh, and it's not just something we decided to do. That's a reflection of the people that buy our cars and have our cars. They really do love their dogs, and a lot of them have dogs, uh, much more than the average. And then we look at other things they do. 20% uh, uh, tell us they go hiking. 10% tell us they go camping. And that's about double what other small crossover owners uh, say, that, how often they say they do it. Uh, then we get to the boating, the canoeing, the kayaking, the rafting, rafting. that's 8%. It's actually a pretty high number, and that's about four times what the average is for a small crossover. So our guys that buy these cars, they really go out there, they really do that stuff. It's not just something that we, that we show on TV. Uh, and so we get to the new car, and so, you know, there's always new models, and, and everybody says it's all new, but with Crosstrek, it's really, really new. If it's not a nut or a bolt or a clip or a fastener on this car, it's, it's, it's a new part. Um, so we'll go into the engineering uh, to start with. And so this is the second model uh, that we've built on our new Subaru Global platform. This new platform is designed to you know, fit our needs for all of our models going forward. So this is the second one. And you'll uh, see more. Uh, the next one would be our three-row vehicle, the Ascent, uh, the next one in line. And this platform is great for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is it gives us a greater level of efficiency in development and production. We can share more parts between models and share the resources and, and the development uh, to lower the cost to, to design and build the car. But it also allows us to, to, because of those savings, have more differentiation between our models and between trim levels of our models. So you may have noticed that with Impreza, there's a lot more differentiation uh, than there used to be. And with Crosstrek, um, you'll know, notice the same. It is designed to support multiple powertrains to keep the future in mind. So uh, the new Crosstrek is, is only a gasoline engine, but uh, this platform could support maybe plug-in hybrid EV models in the future. And then perhaps the biggest story with the new platform is the significant increase in safety. So the amount of energy, crash energy, that this platform can absorb is 1.4 times the current model. It's just a huge jump, especially considering that the, the old Crosstrek was one of the highest rated cars in terms of safety. So this is a huge leap forward. We've got a lower center of gravity height, which is going to improve the hazard avoidance capability, maybe avoid uh, getting into an accident in the first place. And it's also designed uh, to consider future expected safety standards as well, so we can keep uh, achieving the highest marks of safety. And so there's another uh, thing that we're able to do here. And you, if, you, if you look here, we've got uh, a lot of big increases on, on front lateral rigidity, torsional rigidity, and then and the suspension at the front and the rear. And these are huge increases uh, versus the previous model. And this is the kind of thing that you can only really do with a new platform. You got to start over and optimize everything, and redo everything. If you try to do it, Without making a new platform, you end up just adding a lot of weight. So the, the new platform is really the only way you can do it without making the car heavier. <coughs> then uh, a little bit of detail in, in, uh, in, the, in the engineering that went into that. So across the, the so this uh, up in green is the old model, and then uh, here in orange is the new model. And so. Basically, all the joints and the plates and all the interfaces between the different components, they're stronger, they're beefier. Um, the front frame rails are stiffer. The torque box here is much stiffer and much more substantial than it was on the old car. Uh, rear frame joint uh, here is bigger and more substantial. We've also uh, added 23 feet of structural adhesive uh, to the body, which is uh, something that uh, we hadn't done uh, prior to the new platform. And the front bulkhead, which isn't shown uh, where the A-pillar comes in uh, to the body, is really, really much, much stronger than the outgoing model. The other thing we did, aside from making the joint stronger, is using more high-strength steel. Uh, we're 10%, almost 10% up 
on the hot press steel, and then kind of the next level down, the 440 MPA, we're up by 12%. On the, the B pillar, uh, we uh, adopted uh, Taylor roll blanks, so the steel's thinner up high where you don't want the weight, and then it's thicker down lower where you really want the crash strength. <coughs> and we also went to continuous spot welding for more strength in that area. And the other thing that we did is we really just completely rethought about how the crash energy was managed in the car. And so at the front, you know, we, we beef things up. Um, it's much stronger frame rails. We've adopted a kind of a, a gusseted portion of the front bumper beam that's going to help in the small overlap uh, frontal collision. More of that hot press steel. And then uh, when you look at uh, how the crash energy flows on the out, the old model, it's very, a lot of sharp curves and not too many paths. And when you look at the new model, it's really kind of an organic, it's almost like a spine or, or something. That's just a very smooth pass for the energy path for the energy to flow. And then we actually have more paths that it can, that it can take. So that allows us to absorb much more crash energy than the outgoing car and, and really make that big safety jump. Another thing that we were able to do, again, because we had a new platform and we're able to change all the parts, is focus on the handling and, and the, the steering. And so, uh, one thing we did was we fit a very quick steering ratio, uh, 13 to 1, that's basically the same as we have in the BRZ sports car. So very quick uh, steering response, very uh, fun to drive car. The other is stability and the tracking on the highway. And so, you know, one of the things that the the engineers found uh, is, is, is as you drive the car, there's always a delay between when you turn the steering wheel and when the actual car turns. So every car has this delay. And they really, really focus on minimizing that delay because what happens is when you have that delay, you end up inputting more uh, into the steering wheel than necessary. And as you go down the road, you, know, you can see here, you just keep making these minor corrections to just try to keep the car going straight. And it's fatiguing and tiring. And you know, at higher speeds, maybe it makes the car not feel as stable. So they really did a lot to take that out. And you end up with something that at the highway speeds, you've got stability and straight tracking. But at lower speeds, you've got that really fun to drive, quick steering and handling. It's, it's a really nice combination that uh, they could really could do only because we had this new platform. And then uh, adapt, active torque vectoring, something we added uh, several years back to WRX and we've expanded to other models. Um, that's on all, uh, all the new cross track, and what that does is, in uh, when you're accelerating uh, out of the turn, it will break the uh, the inboard wheel to help uh, swing the, the car around and, and have a improved cornering performance. New suspension, front and rear, same story. Because we're doing this new platform, we get a chance to rethink everything. We can do more than playing around with springs and damper rates. We can change the geometry and, and stiffen everything up. So we added a, a K brace on the front. Uh, we moved the stabilizer uh, from the uh, front arm, the suspension arm to the strut for better efficiency. The cross member uh, structure strengthened at the engine and suspension mounts. And uh, here we changed the housing from steel to aluminum to reduce unsprung weight. And then the mass offset, which is uh, something that contributes to the the steering uh, vibration in a car, we were able to reduce that by 15%, which is a pretty big number uh, there. At the rear, same story. Um, everything's stiffer, strengthened, um, less uh, flex. And another thing that we did is we mounted the rear stabilizer bar. Uh, rather than mount it to the subframe, it actually mounts to the body of the car. And that lets it be more efficient and reduce body roll by about 50% compared to the outgoing uh, model. And this chart really explains kind of how all, the, all that stuff that we did on the suspension and, and the platform comes together. And so this is uh, how much vibration you'll experience in the car. And so at the bottom, uh, this is the level of vibration. Um, so smaller is better than large, you're feeling uh, less vibration. And then the vertical axis is damping. So how quick is it over? So you hit a bump in the car, you feel the car shake. So the best place to be is in this bottom corner. It means you don't feel much and it's over really quick. And so you can see the new model, um, that's what happens. So when you, you, you know, feel something, uh, you hit a pothole or something in the road, you're gonna feel less vibration in the car. It's gonna be over sooner. So you're gonna get a more comfortable ride in addition to that uh, great handling. And for reference, um, 
We did put on two competitors. One's a small Japanese uh, competitor known for making uh, fun to drive uh, crossovers. And then we picked a, a European competitor uh, as well, known for making fun to drive cars. So you can see where we stack up uh, relative to those. Um, again, I know I keep saying the same thing, but with the new platform, we get to do all these other things to improve the car that we just can't do uh, on a year-to-year -year change. Um, so because the new platform is so much stiffer, that means all the stuff that bolts to the platform or attaches to the platform is going to move around less. It's going to improve, improve MVH just as, as a result of having the stiffer platform. But we're able to do other things like reduce the number of pass-throughs through the front bulkhead for wiring and harnesses and, and uh, brake lines and all that sort of thing. And so there are fewer pass-throughs, there are fewer opportunities for sound to get out of the engine compartment and get into the car. So we can make it quieter. We did also add additional sound insulation as well. Uh, that, of course, uh, helps out making it uh, quieter. We adopted a sound reduction windshield, and we put thicker glass uh, on the other windows. Of course, being the new model, we uh, improved the aerodynamics a little bit. And then the uh, climate control system. This is another area where you know, typically you don't really change too much, but with the new platform, the engineers were able to rethink uh, the whole climate control system. And, and the old cross track, actually, if you cranked everything all the way up, it was kind of loud in the car, a lot of lower noise. And, you know, because of uh, the opportunity to kind of rethink where all the air is routed and all the paths for, for the ducting and the shape and diameters and, and that sort of thing, we were able to make it much, much quieter uh, than a lot of our competitors. So, big improvement in just noise level from the climate control system. Then we get into braking. Same story uh, as the steering, basically. Keep looking at every individual part to try to uh, take unnecessary tolerance uh, out of the system and, and give you a nice linear response to driver input. Uh, you're going to get uh, better brake feel and better brake performance, but you're also going to get a reduction in how much you're pressing the brake pedal before the car starts slowing down. And that's going to improve your confidence in how, how you think about the car driving. Uh, then we get to the engine. So uh, the, the engine is it's still a two-liter engine, and it's still a boxer engine uh, uh, as the previous generation car. But it's 80% new components. So even though the kind of basic engine design is the same, uh, we are able to, uh, or we changed 80% of the components. Um, and achieve a 26 pound weight reduction, which is a huge weight reduction considering that we, we added direct injection to the engine as well. So there's a lot of extra parts going in. So this is a substantial weight reduction for the engine. And, uh, and if uh, our engineers do tell us it's the highest thermal efficiency in its class. Uh, in terms of horsepower, we do get a small bump uh, versus the outgoing car. And it is mounted about 10 millimeters lower in the chassis, which is going to contribute to that lower center of gravity height better uh, handling performance. On the transmission side, it's a similar story. A lot of changes uh, to the CBT. And our engineers tell us that it's the greatest uh, ratio coverage spread uh, for any CBT that doesn't have a, a secondary or auxiliary gearbox. We've adopted a lighter uh, torque converter. And so that's going to help the engine respond quicker to input. So it's going to feel a lot punchier when you, you put, uh, put the accelerator down. And we fitted an ultra short pitch chain, which is partially what allows us to get that better ratio coverage and uh, also makes the transmission quieter. And if some of you guys haven't driven a Subaru in the last couple of years, uh, we adopted auto's uh, step speed control. So when, when we launched Crosstrek, we didn't have this feature, but the recent model years have. So not a new feature for this car, but worth mentioning. Because um, the way that works is when you're driving just kind of slowly and, and kind of relax. Uh, the transmission just varies continuously, giving you the most uh, fuel economy. But when you put your foot down and you want to accelerate quickly, a, a lot of people want kind of the traditional automatic transmission feel, and so we uh, program the transmission to uh, simulate a seven-speed automatic in that case. And so you get the feeling of a traditional transmission when you really want it, and the efficiency when, when you want it. So it's kind of a good balance uh, of meeting customer desire. Uh, in terms of the manual transmission, so that does stay with the new model. It's available on the base and the premium trim level, so you can get it on more than the base model. It, uh, it adds a sixth gear. It improves the fuel economy down, uh, on high speed cruising down the highway. 
and it does have better shift build, shift feel than, than the old five speed. Uh, and this is just a chart showing how the uh, CBT ratio coverage compares. This is the old cross track and the new cross track, and you know how that translates into both better uh, efficiency. You can have a lower RPM at speed, or you can uh, spin the engine up, you know, or spin, sorry, um, use the transmission spread for acceleration when you want it. And so, the, kind of the combination with the engine and transmission improvements is we're able to claim best in class all wheel drive highway fuel economy. So, you know, essentially better than everybody in the class and a lot of competitors in, in a larger uh, segment. And if we think about front wheel drive competitors, you know, we have standard all wheel drive, but we're still better than uh, nearly everybody um, comparing our all wheel drive to their front wheel drive models. And we, you know, we do come in third. There are two that come just one mile per gallon better than us uh, with their front wheel drive, but those cars are quite a bit smaller and, and less capable than ours. So with a 16.6 .6 gallon uh, gas tank and that highway, uh, Kind of a, a highway fuel economy, you get a tremendous, like almost 550 mile cruising range, which works out to like nine hours of driving at 60 miles an hour. So, just a huge cruising range for this car and better than uh, nearly everybody else. <clears throat> uh, just a few uh, aerodynamic highlights. And so, the, the front, just a lot of little tweaks uh, to improve the fuel efficiency, uh, just refinements of the edges around the sides and the front of the car. The, kind of the space between, or the gap between the windshield and the A-pillar is reduced for, for more aerodynamics. And then the back, small tweak to the roof line, lowers drag by about 2%. And then we have these kind of crisp lines at the back edge to help the air break away and, and reduce drag. On the bottom, we fitted a large number of, kind of flat aerodynamic panels. And uh, we did you know, tweak the side mirror shape to reduce noise and, and drag as well. So uh, next up, we'll talk about safety and connectivity. So the first step uh, for, for Subaru safety is really visibility. So we, we've always uh, felt that having a car with good visibility improves your situal, situational awareness and is, uh, you know, hopefully reduces your likelihood of being in an accident at all. Uh, so we've got the same outstanding forward visibility as the current model. We've got uh, low side sills. Uh, same as the current model, but uh, pretty low compared to a lot of our competitors. We've got very thin A-pillars, and we've mounted the mirrors uh, to the body, so we're able to add additional uh, visibility here in this little quarter window. Uh, the B-pillar is slimmer than uh, what a lot of our competitors have, and then the, the D-pillar is kind of a, um, you know, worth mentioning, because a lot of our competitors don't have a window there, or they just have huge D-pillars to make rear visibility very difficult. Um, not the case for cross track. Uh, structure, we talked about that. Uh, just kind of have it in here again, just as a reminder for the, the impact that that's having on safety performance. Uh, other passive safety features, so we have seven airbags, which is the same count as current. Um, we uh, did adopt enhanced seat belts that feature a locking tongue. Those are going to reduce the movement in your lap belt, so they basically the tongue will lock and prevent the seat belt from moving and help you stay in the seat better and reduce your probability of uh, injury. Uh, we fitted double pretensioners on the shoulder and lap belts at the front and then at the rear we've added pretensioners and load limiters on the outboard seat belts. In terms of hazard avoidance performance, uh, our target was really best in class and this is a, a basically a double lane change. Oh, sorry, starting here, uh, you know, change the lane, change back. Similar to what uh, Consumer Reports would do, although this is uh, our in-house testing. And uh, so you can see here's the 17 model year cross track and there's those uh, two competitors again. You can see we're able to do this maneuver quite a bit faster uh, than the outgoing car and the 18 inch wheels because there's less uh, movement in the sidewall and the tires are even faster yet. So hopefully with that level of handling performance that can also reduce the likelihood that you would be in an accident in the first place. Uh, then we get to the active safety features. So new things for Crosstrek are steering responsive headlights, which uh, basically take, account, uh, take into account the vehicle speed and the steering uh, input to help point the, light, the headlights uh, in the path that the vehicle is going to be heading in. 
And so those are huge, huge increase in lighting performance at night. And they do uh, comply with the advanced lamp criteria for the uh, TSP plus uh, rating from IHS. Another feature that we were uh, able to add to Crosstrek is uh, called high beam assist. And so that uses the eyesight system to detect when situations arise that it's appropriate to turn on the high beams. We find you know, something that people don't use as much as they could because um, it's maybe too much effort or they're not sure, they don't want to bother other drivers. Uh, so they're really not getting as much light in normal use as they could. So this kind of automates that and hopefully improves lighting further. Uh, blind spot detection with rear cross traffic alert and uh, the active torque vectoring um, available as well. Then we get to the next level, was the, is, which is the preventative safety equipment. So first up is our eyesight system. This is the same eyesight system as in uh, last year's uh, model and all our other models. Um, this is the same system that's uh, rated uh, superior, the highest rating uh, in terms of performance by IAHS. And we've augmented that with another new feature we call reverse automatic braking. So uh, philosophically, it functions like eyesight in reverse. It, looks for obstacles, if it detects something that uh, it's in the way and, and it doesn't sense that the driver's responding, it will give you an alert. And if, if you don't respond to the alert, it will automatically apply the brakes and stop the vehicle. Uh, but from a technology standpoint, it's, it's made uh, at slower parking lot speeds, you're not driving very fast in reverse, and it uses different hardware and different technology uh, to do those things. And uh, lastly, we've got our connected uh, safety uh, through our Starlink connected vehicle services. So uh, this uses a built-in 4G LTE modem that uh, in the event of an accident, it will automatically uh, help call for, uh, call for help. And uh, it's got a lot of other uh, cool features uh, as well, maintenance notification, enhanced roadside <laughs> assistance, multi-vehicle uh, re health reports, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, including a uh, stolen vehicle uh, recovery service or uh, security alarm notifications. It's a, it's a lot of cool features, but uh, really the, the biggest feeling of safety, you know, is knowing that if you get into an accident, you can't call for help, the car will do it for you. And so I, I never, you know, from a personal experience, I never really thought about that. Uh, but my sister actually got into an accident and, and you know, she couldn't call for help and uh, that did. So it was a really neat, uh, neat feature. Uh, and then we move on to the connectivity part. And so all of the new Crosstrek models are, are built with what we call, at least internally, our Gen 3 infotainment system. It's all new hardware for our audio units, uh, made with some of the best partners in the uh, industry. So uh, all the uh, audio units themselves are made by Harman International. Every Crosstrek has Android Auto and Apple CarPlay on it. Um, the, the uh, larger head units feature HD radio and SXM uh, with travel link. We've simplified the Bluetooth pairing process. And navigation models include TomTom uh, -tom navigation, so kind of an industry standard uh, for Tom or for navigation performance. And uh, for the first time in uh, Crosstrex history, we've added a premium uh, eight-speaker uh, audio system uh, to the car. So uh, never had that before. So that's big news and it's actually a really, really nice system. So give it a listen uh, when you drive the car. Just a 432 uh, watt equivalent eight speaker sound system. It's a really, really nice uh, sound system. Then we have our uh, Subaru Starlink Cloud app. So in addition to the applications that you could find on the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, we have some other apps that in our own uh, Starlink Cloud that are maybe a little bit more tightly integrated with the vehicle than you could get through a third party. Uh, so as, as an example, one is uh, Right Track, uh, which is an application with Liberty Mutual Insurance. You know, that's something that can uh, help our owners uh, you know, get, get, get input or feedback on their driving style and, and help them save on car insurance. Uh, we've got uh, Yelp and Best Parking and, and Glimpse. Uh, those are tied into the, the vehicle navigation system so they can help they take you to the, uh, the restaurant that you chose. For example, we've got a quick guide, which is a, basically a reference guide or really, really basic owner's manual to, to provide information uh, right on the head unit. And then uh, we also have eBird, which is a bird watching app that uh, is developed, uh, was developed by Cornell University. And uh, it's actually, uh, of all the apps, I think that is maybe the most popular app that we have. So um, 
is a Subaru, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then just a quick comment on, on how we manage all the information in the car. So up uh, between the gauges, uh, this is essentially information for the driver only, stuff that's maybe more critical, more important. Then at the top, we have a secondary screen that uh, we use to display vehicle condition info or kind of general operation info. And then the infotainment system has all the uh, connectivity uh, features, the audio and that sort of thing. So then we'll get to the next section, which is um, really the, the, the most exciting part about Crosstrack is just how ready this car is for anything that you can throw at it. So the first up is packaging. So uh, I think you'll, you'll find when you get into the Crosstrack, it's, it's not too big outside, it's really big inside. And so some of the things we did is we, we grew the body, uh, similar to what we did uh, for the 17 model year Preza, but uh, by different amounts, um, kind of cleverly. So the overall uh, width and length uh, don't, incre don't increase as much as they did on the Preza. Um, length is up about just over half an inch, and uh, uh, yet the rear leg room is up over an inch. Uh, in terms of uh, height, technically it's the same height as before, um, but the roof is slightly lower and the roof rails are slightly higher. So a little bit of difference there. But, uh, and then in terms of width, uh, the overall width is up uh, almost an inch, but the body width, the, the, the sheet metal width, is up nearly two inches. And so uh, kind of they, they, they pulled in some of the cladding and, and some of the wood, but we grew the, the kind of the cockpit area of the car more so. And uh, a couple other uh, parts of that. So uh, the front and rear hip room in the car, so those are up by almost three inches at the front and two inches at the back, so more than the width of the car uh, due to clever packaging, thinner door panels. We've got greater footwell space both in the front and the rear, and, and part of that is, is, is going back to the climate control system. We were able to reposition and change the shape and routings of the ducts and get them Know, more out of the way for your feet. Uh, rear car room capacity is up almost three cubic feet. The rear wheel wells are almost an inch further apart, so you get more space to jam stuff in the back. And we can fit three golf bags without blocking the rear visibility. Another thing uh, in terms of <coughs> versatility is we adopted these kind of split design taillights on the back of the car. And there's kind of regulations for how small we can make a tail light. And so, um, you know, you, you can't, you can only make it so small and comply with regulations, but you can split it in half. And so we split it in half, and by putting half on the, uh, the rear lift gate and the other half on the body, we can actually increase the width of the rear cargo area so we don't have to kind of bump out to clear the tail light. So the rear cargo area width goes up by almost four inches. So huge increase in the amount of available width you have to just put stuff in the back. And then when we look at the overall uh, size of the car and interior capacity, so here's the, the old cross track, so it got a little bit longer. Um, it is maybe on, on the long side compared to uh, several of our competitors, but in terms of width, we're kind of in, in the middle. So not, not anything unusual, but when you look at the interior volume, we are much, much greater in interior volume than all of our competitors and, and even greater than some cars in the next segment up. So just a lot of space in this car, uh, but still a small size. It's easy to park, easy to, to drive around the city or anywhere else. Uh, and then we added X mode. So X mode is a technology that we've had several years on our other models. We've never had it on Crosstrek before. And you know that it's really designed to help the car handle slippery conditions uh, better and with more confidence than, uh, than without it. And so that could be dirt, gravel, rocks, uh, or snow or ice. I mean, you guys may not have too much of that down here. Um, but it does, does work in uh, all those slippery conditions. And it also has a hill descent control function. So if you're coming down a steep hill off-road, uh, it will automatically uh, control the brakes to let the vehicle descend at a constant speed that, that you control, and you, all you have to do is just steer and not worry about anything else. Is it standard? Is That's it standard? Uh, on all, all models with automatic transmission, yes. Automatic transmission. Yeah. Um, so basically, 
at, uh, at low speed, you just uh, push the button on the center console and it will essentially make a lot of subtle changes in the drive line. It will uh, basically uh, kind of reduce the sensitivity of the accelerator a little bit so you can have more fine control to manage the, the, the traction uh, on, on your own side. And then we uh, change to a lower gear ratio in the transmission. The torque converter doesn't lock up. The VDC and all-wheel drive system is kind of I guess I can say um, more sensitive, more responsive than normal, and uh, can react quicker and, and uh, more aggressively. That's uh, again to give you that uh, improved uh, traction performance. And then at uh, speeds of 25 miles an hour, it will just automatically turn off. You really don't need it at, at those speeds. Another part of Crosstrek, you know, it's a small crossover, but it's, it's a real crossover, and it does everything that you would expect a crossover at any size to do. And so one of those things is, is towing. And so most of our competitors uh, don't allow any towing. And there's a couple that do, um, but maybe it's not a standard capability. So with Crosstrek, every Crosstrek can tow up to 1,500 pounds, which, you know, that's more in line with what you see in the next segment up, like a RAV4 or a CRV, that kind of towing performance, um, which again, most of our competitors don't offer or at least don't make that capability standard. Then we get into uh, ground clearance. So 8.7 inches is uh, more than anybody else as a standard, uh, although the, uh, the Renegade does match us with some of the higher trims. Um, uh, nobody exceeds us in terms of ground clearance. And that, that is important because nearly a third of Crosstrek owners, uh, they tell us that they go off-road, uh, they take the car off-road. So things like X mode and ground clearance and, and you know, that level of off-road performance is important to our buyers. Uh, and another part of that is we talked about the boating and the, the kayaking and everything. And so, you know, we put uh, roof rails on every Crosstrek. And so those support our genuine accessory crossbars. Uh, we have a couple different types, but they also support a lot of aftermarket stuff as well. They have a pretty generous 150 pound load limit and, and more kind of spread to improve the, the versatility, but it's a really versatile roof racking system. It works with our stuff, it works with aftermarket stuff, it works with stuff our owners have uh, maybe from a last car or they just accumulated over the years. You know, and it's just worth mentioning because again, a lot of those uh, other competitors that we have, they don't have roof rails that fit adjustable crossbars or, or that versatile. A lot of them are just kind of a fixed position, can't move them, can't adjust them type of design, which is, is less versatile. So uh, coming down to the end, we'll get to the model lineup. So basically three trim levels, the 2.0i, the premium, and the limited. And you can see the kind of the key features at each trim level and the stuff that's highlighted in orange is stuff that we've added in the new generation of the car. And we get to the top, you've got the pricing. And so the base model, with all the improvements that we, we talked about, is only $100 more than the base model last year. So it's, it's a really huge improvement uh, for a very small increase in the price, the base price. But another part of that is that last year, the base model, we didn't have an automatic transmission available. We had to get a premium. So if you're like most people, you really want an automatic transmission in your car, your opportunity to buy a Crosstrek is, is, is greater because since we've added it to the base model, a Crosstrek with an automatic transmission is actually about $700 less than a Crosstrek with an automatic last year. So that car is actually less expensive uh, if, you know, if you want an automatic. Uh, option packages, uh, pretty straightforward. We don't have any on the base. When we get to the premium, we've got a few different packages with eyesight and blind spot detection in the moonroof. And then on the limited, uh, we add in um, the reverse auto braking, the high beam assist, uh, and the Navi and the audio system. Uh, in terms of color lineup, so we have uh, kind of our traditional colors uh, here on the left, and then on the right we've got some of the colors, with the, maybe the most fun being the cool gray khaki and the sunshine orange. And you know, one thing about Crosstrek owners is that they really actually like these kind of vibrant, uh, fun colors to the point where uh, basically one in four Crosstreks so far are either cool gray khaki or sunshine orange. Wow. So it's a really, really popular color choices. Although we're still early, we're only two months in, uh, but people really, really like those color choices. They like them in the outgoing model, and so we think it will continue. 
Uh, interior colors, we basically have two options. We've got a black uh, interior, and then we have a high contrast gray. Um, and then we get into the initial sales work. So we're, we're about two months in, so you know this probably will change a little bit over time, but just to give you guys an idea of, of, of where everything fits in. So we're more than half premium trim level, uh, but uh, of what's left, about just over a third are limited, and not as many base models. And then uh, we look at EyeSight, it's about 50% take rate. It's a really, really popular feature. People really love the safety and the convenience of everything EyeSight offers. And manual transmission, uh, it's, it's running right now about 5%. So. Uh, in terms of competitors, um, you know, who do we see as key competitors? You know, maybe the bigger cars here are maybe brands we think of as, as closer competitors and the smaller ones maybe less so, but this is such a new segment and it's been changing so quickly and so rapidly that we're really just kind of paying attention to everyone in, in the segment. Uh, so then we, we get to the, the wrap up slide. Yay! Um, so, uh, uh, you know, kind of the engineering side, um, we've got the new global platform, all the benefits that that brings to the table. You know, we didn't really talk about it in the presentation, but longevity, 96% um, of the Subaru models made in the last 10 years are still on the road. We've got lowest five-year cost of own, according to Kelly Blue Book. We've got 33 miles per gallon on the highway, plus all-wheel drive. And we get to the adventure component. We've got available X mode uh, with hill descent control. We've got the standard symmetrical all-wheel drive, 8.7 inches of ground clearance, um, great handling, standard roof rails. We've got you know, it's something I didn't mention, but it is true. It's wide uh, rear gate opening, but also wide door openings to get more stuff in and out of the car, not just people. Up to 1,500 pounds of towing capacity. Uh, we've got the connectivity, all the uh, safety acronyms, so the BSD, RAV, HVS, so all that stuff. Um, we've got the latest infotainment technology, CarPlay and Android Auto, that's standard uh, in the car. We've got excellent outward visibility and, of course, the connected vehicle services. And so with that, uh, you have any questions? <laughs> 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 I make both.